for the audio or you can even watch back Giving players all the props or put them on blast We don't give no hot takes, only talk facts We're giving all our devotion Riding high on this wave of emotion Going all out, yeah, cause this is our time No, we no stopping us till we reach the finish line To my man Sammy, got it off the ground And to all the listeners tuned in right now Got debates, analysis, and speculation This is sports talk for the new generation You know where to find us, got a reputation Sick podcast, your number one sports destination We're giving all our devotion Riding high on this wave of emotion Going all out, yeah, cause this is our time No, we no stopping us till we reach the finish line. All in, we came in. into the sick podcast with tony maradero 55 seconds left in the penalty a minute and 27 seconds left in regulation time boston four montreal three 
Lafleur coming out rather gingerly on the right side. He gives it into the mayor back to Lafleur. Oh! The sickest Montreal Canadiens podcast. <laughs> you know, I, 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 You're in the oh! sports entertainment like no other. Rejoint, on lui fait perdre la rondelle une passe devant. Et c'est la bonne chose. Ce sera la victoire des Canadiens. You found the dogs! John, you found the dogs! He found the dogs! And all together they worked a young team to the top. And now a 24th Stanley Cup banner will hang from the rafters of the famous forum in Montreal. The Canadians win the Stanley Cup! Brought to you by Energy Transportation Group. Driven to be different. La Vida TV. Embrace your true nature. And Locage. If the last time you went to Locage was when the Habs won the cup, it's time you went back to Locage. It's going to be sick. Marinaro on this Monday night. It is March 6th. It is uh, six minutes. No, six minutes. It is one minute. What am I saying six minutes? Because it's March 6th. I got confused. And I said it's six minutes. Oh, man, it's going to be one of those shows tonight. It is one minute past uh, 10 p.m. Eastern. Uh, and, uh, of course, the Sick Podcast is brought to you by Energy. Look at that. Energy Transportation Group, a leading full-service logistics provider serving all of North America. They are driven to be different. And, of course, also by La Bit at TB. Uh, brewed in Quebec, a winner of a dozen international awards. La Bit at TB offers... Quality microbrewery beers made with premium ingredients for everyone's taste. La Bitta TV, embrace your true nature. There's a lot going on. The Canadians are off, uh, but they're back from a four-game road trip in which uh, they weren't very good, uh, which is good news. And uh, they go on a uh, a four-game homestand. Now, mind you, it's, uh, it's not going to be easy because uh, the Canadians are going to play uh, on Tuesday. They're going to play um, Carolina. Uh, on Thursday, they're going to host the New York Rangers. And then on Saturday, they're going to host the New Jersey Devils. On Monday, they'll host the defending Stanley Cup champion, Colorado Avalanche. And the next night, the night after that, they're going to be in Pittsburgh when they visit the Penguins. A couple of nights later, they're going to visit the Panthers in Florida. A couple of nights after that, they're going to visit the Lightning in Tampa. And then Tampa's going to come here for a game. And then the Bruins, uh, they play the Bruins here. It's not going to be easy. As a matter of fact, the Canadians have the toughest schedule between now and the end of the year, which kind of gets me a little bit excited because everyone knows that I say that if the Montreal Canadiens are not going to make the playoffs, at that point, they might as well finish in no man's land. Uh, what's going on with my camera tonight? Is it me or I did television earlier tonight and um, I, I did it from home and uh, they asked me to change up my camera a little bit, which I did. And now all of a sudden I find that it's just, uh, it's uh, is it me or... Uh, there's something missing here. Hold on a second. I shouldn't be doing this, but I'll do it anyway. All right. Is that better? I think that's better. Why is it? That I just, uh, there's something wrong here. This is a disaster, right? Eh? This is a disaster. All right. This is a, this is a, all right. There. Okay. That's a lot better. Now that was a disaster. I know I shouldn't have done that, but I, you know, if I'm going to do the entire show and it's going to drive me crazy because I, I can't get the, the, the angle that I want, uh, it's going to drive me. Sammy says there's nothing wrong. Okay. He tells me that in the chat. Thank you, Sammy. But I, I don't know. In my head, there was something wrong. But I should have listened to you, Sammy, because you're the best. All right. Uh, Eric Engels is usually a regular contributor on Monday nights. But uh, Eric is actually probably in a plane right about now. So uh, Stu Cowan from the Montreal Gazette and HockeyInsideOut.com is going to join us. There he is. I would have liked to have had Pat Hickey, uh, formerly from the Montreal Gazette, join us also tonight but unfortunately he couldn't because he had a commitment but i woke up this morning to like such amazing news on social media Stu, how are you i'm good yourself 
Very, very good. It was a couple of weeks ago that you and Pat joined me on the program because we heard that the Gazette was going through some budget cuts. And um, and what a move Pat made. 78 years old, but still for a love for the game, a love for writing, a love for journalism, a love for his job. And he said that uh, you were on a Zoom call, probably give or take about 25 or 30 of you, if memory serves me well. Mm -hmm. And they were talking about budget cuts. And as that Zoom call was going on, Pat was just thinking about there has to be some young journalist probably with the Gazette that was probably going to end up losing their job over this. A young journalist who probably was was about to start their career or early on in their career, probably with a, a mortgage to pay on a home or something like that. And Pat felt kind of like the right thing to do was to step aside. So what did he do? He decided to step aside, take an early retirement. But Stu, we could all tell that he was... He was walking away, but he was very, very sad to do so. Uh, but you talked about how good a man Pat is, and Pat just decided to do it. And then this morning, I wake up to news from the Hockey News that the Hockey News is going to have, I think, 32 sites covering all NHL teams, and they'll have one covering the Montreal Canadiens. And who did they reach out to? They reached out to Pat Hickey. And, uh, and uh, Pat accepted, and he's going to be doing it. And I just... I. I think it's a beautiful end to the story, right? Because Pat walks away, uh, someone younger um, who's probably starting off their career early on in the career is going to be able to continue at the Gazette. And Pat is, is, is taking up a new challenge and still working. So um, all's well that ends well, I guess, huh? Well, Tony, one of my biggest beliefs in life is what goes around comes around. And this is another example of that. Uh, you're absolutely right, Pat. We had a Zoom conference and there was going to be layoffs at the Gazette. Uh, at first, there was possibly as many as 10 and it ended up being less than that. But, you know, there was people upset on, on the Zoom conference. And as you said, younger people with mortgages and young kids and whatnot. And Pat just felt in his heart that it, it wasn't for him to keep going. It wasn't the right thing to do when he meant him leaving could save a younger person's job. And that's exactly what he did. And he did save somebody's job. So it says a lot about Pat the person. And like I said, I believe what goes around comes around. And I, I know for sure that Pat did not know this hockey news thing was coming up when he made that decision. And it was a pleasant surprise for him when he found out. And I'm happy for Pat. Um, he, he walked away reluctantly. He loved his job. He loved working. He thought he, was, he, he had no intentions of retiring or, or quitting what he was doing. And uh, he did what he thought was the right thing. And uh, again, what goes around comes around and the hockey yeah. news thing came up and they reached out to him. So I'm really happy for Pat. What goes around comes around is uh, one saying. And the other one is, of course, when uh, one door closes, another one opens. Right. Yep. And that's exactly, exactly what's happened here for, you know, Stu, I was, I, I got to tell you, I was crossing my fingers and, and praying to God that something like this was going to happen. Right. Uh, I was like, you, you know, the, the, to be honest with you, the thing I was hoping for was, um, you know, things were probably going to something was going to happen at the Gazette and they were going to find ways to, like, keep everyone, including Pat. But when that didn't happen, I was like, you know what, hopefully something happens. And then I wake up this morning. It's kind of like you wish for something and it happens. It was all pretty cool. It was all really, really cool. So well, so that's I'm great. I'm happy for Pat, Tony, because he's not a guy. He's, he loves to work. There's parts in his life when he's had two or three jobs going at the same time. Uh, he likes to keep busy. He's, as he said, and last time he was on the podcast with you, he's not a guy to sit at home and watch TV and do nothing. He was hoping to find something else to keep himself busy. This keeps him busy. It keeps him involved with the Canadians. It keeps him around the press box. It's uh, it's good news all around. I'm really happy for him. Yeah, I was, um, I was, um, like I said, I was. I, I, I was, it was a beautiful story. Like as sad as it was, it was, it was kind of beautiful seeing everyone come together for Pat and, and, and applaud Pat, uh, rightfully so. And, uh, anyway, it's, uh, it's, it's a cool ending to the story. Um, what is the hockey news going to be doing exactly? I mean, I well, read that they're opening up 32 sites for 32 teams, but, uh, what is it exactly, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, I just saw the press release as, as you did, um, it looks like going to have one person sort of blogging for each team. I think they announced four today, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I read the press release earlier this morning, and Montreal Canadiens are one of them with, with Pat doing it. So, um, yeah, it's a new initiative they're taking on. Like all 
media or i mean i remember growing up and getting the printed copy of the hockey news at home the magazine and mm -hmm. reading it and uh like all businesses and all newspapers uh, you know it's going digital it's going online and this is their next step in uh making more of a step online and, and having their plan is to have a site for uh for each team in the nhl so it's uh, it's a smart move by graham roasting who owns the hockey news he's a smart guy and uh it'll be interesting to see how it uh, works out moving forward and hopefully it works out well for them and hopefully it works out well for pat yeah. also graham is a montrealer is he not he is he is he's yeah. i believe his first uh, job in the media was delivering the gazette he's been very successful in business through bauer and some other companies and yeah i believe the reason he bought the hockey news is he used to read the hockey news as a kid like i did and when he saw it was in financial trouble he stepped up and uh, purchased it and uh has kept it going so this is his latest uh his latest initiative to to keep the hockey news going and uh hopefully it keeps going for a long time i'd like to see all media publications doing well and it's a tough business right now for all of us including yeah. the Montreal Gazette, which is why we've had these recent layoffs wasn't he um he associated with the montreal canadians at one point in time graham rooster he, he was or interested he? in uh he was one of the people interested in buying the team or at least he was sure. part of a group looking to buy the team when jeff molson ended up uh, purchasing them yeah yeah so, um, i mean he's a, he's a hockey guy right he that's uh he lives and breathes hockey and uh, that's yeah. why about the hockey news and that's why he's trying to do this latest thing also no uh, that's uh that's pretty cool hey uh Stu, uh other than pat of course uh, the other big news, I mean, it's been all over the Montreal airwaves today, print, media, television, radio, everywhere, is uh, Quebec Major Junior Hockey League Commissioner yeah. uh, Gilles Courteau handing in his resignation yesterday. Now, for those who aren't <laughs> aware, um, Dan Carcillo, former NHLer, uh, brought to light um, stories of rookie initiations and how far they go this was some time ago was picked up by rick westhead who did an inquiry into that rick is absolutely fantastic at mm -hmm. what he does by the way and uh, he did an inquiry into that and uh, mario leclerc of radio canada who's also fantastic at what he does in my opinion came out with a story uh probably uh, give or take about a month ago once again, diving deeper into the, or less than that, into the uh, initiations and everything that takes place in junior hockey. We've heard of some terrible, terrible stories that, uh, for whatever reason, some athletes, players thought was a fitting initiation, but really what it was was physical abuse, sexual abuse, psychological abuse. I mean, using hockey sticks to... Uh, abuse other players uh, and uh, um, cases of 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 of, uh, of just stories that are so disgusting that even though uh, this podcast is 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 not censored and we could pretty much say whatever we want and that's the beauty of podcasts it's still rather not it's so troubling and so disgusting uh, but Commissioner Corto had gone in front of Parliament and uh, denied any knowledge of initiations <clears throat> whatsoever. And then when he was asked about it again, uh, kind of backtracked and said that, you know, he uh, he hadn't read all the stories and he wasn't really aware. And at that point, you know, he was called out from the media and who said, this is inexcusable, this is wrong, and you know what, something has to happen here. And before they could get rid of him, he was supposed to retire at the end of the year anyway after 35-plus years with Quebec Major Junior Hockey League, he, he decides to hand in his resignation. And we're hearing that Mario Cicchini, mm -hmm. former president of the Montreal Oets, acting interim president, is uh, has been voted on by the uh, the league owners to be the next commissioner of the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League. So we'll get to that in a second. But first, your thoughts on Commissioner Corto resigning. Well, we were talking about the hockey news earlier, Tony. I used to freelance for the hockey news covering the Quebec Junior League back in the late 80s. And Jill Corteau was a commissioner back then. He's been around a long, long time. As you mentioned with these initiation things, they are sickening. These are young kids who do dumb, stupid things. But there's adults in the room. There's adult coaches and GMs and commissioners. And to say that they had no clue any of this was going on over a 40-year span or whatever it was that he was commissioner of the league is hard to believe. And if he didn't know, then you have to think, well, maybe he wasn't doing his job as well as he should have been doing it. Uh, it seems to have been somewhat rampant from some of the stories we've been hearing, uh, that junior hockey culture. And, and as I say, these kids are 
you know, if you have a son, you, you just send your kid at 16 years old or 17 years old away to go play in Ramuski or Shakutami or somewhere like that. And you're hoping that the parents who are in charge, the coaches, the GMs, the billets, etc., are doing what's best for your kids and taking care of them. And it seems like that wasn't always the case in a lot of these initiation things. And for coaches and GMs and commissioners, they had no idea that stuff like that was going on. I find that hard to believe. Um, but on the bright side, hopefully now that it's coming to light, Joel Corteau resigning, the head of Hockey Canada resigned yeah. just before all these things came out about the World Junior Championships and whatnot. So now maybe the next time an initiation tries to get started in junior hockey, some of the adults in the room will speak up uh, like they should have in the past and for whatever reasons they didn't. Just it, it, It's like it was a sickening part of – hockey culture especially junior hockey culture we're, we're not going to feel sorry for him so we're going to get to that in just a minute but it, it really is so unfortunate eh when you've spent 35 plus years as a commissioner and the commissioner did do some good things he brought mm-hmm. the league to higher heights there's more uh you know the franchises yeah. went from three hundred thousand dollars a franchise to like three four five million dollars a franchise i mean the, the 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 league grew so much, but yeah. what a pity it is! Like what a pity when a thirty five year career ends like that. Well, I mean, they stand sh- outside of Quebec, and it goes back to what I was saying earlier, Tony. What goes around comes around, and it's coming around here now. And as you said, he was supposed to retire, so you have to think that for him to step down now, maybe he realized that maybe there's some evidence that he did know that was going to come to light. And I guess that he felt at this point it was just best for him to just sort of step aside and, and move on. And for Mario Cicchini, I don't know Mario. I think you do, Tony. I've, I've yeah. met him once at the Sports Celebrity Breakfast. Uh, just said hello briefly. Uh, but from what he did with the Alouettes and everything I've heard about him, he's a really smart guy. He seems to be a well-respected guy. And this seems like a good decision for the Quebec Junior League. It seems like an uh, unfortunate thing for the Alouettes. I mean, he had already basically been fired and then brought back to, to sort of put the, the, the team back on track, and now it looks like he's gone again. So, uh, you know, it looks like you mean new ownership with the Alouettes, uh, potentially. Uh, it be interesting to see who they hire as their next president, but it's not an easy job, and uh, it seems like good news for the Quebec Junior League and bad news for the Alouettes. So, look, I'm going to say this. Uh, I, I do know Mario Cicchini. I don't know him overly well uh you know i've had a chance to meet him on a couple of occasions um mario's very very bright mario's a stand-up guy mario has a lot of integrity i thought mario did great job for the alouettes uh mario's got a media background he's got a a background of managing people he's got a background of uh, dealing with the business community um he's got a background of you know meeting with ceos owners vps of of uh, big companies and organizations uh obviously he's got a sporting background he worked in sports um having said that i'm surprised they went in that direction not that he's not going to do a good job i'm sure he will mario will do a good job at anything he does i'm surprised that this time around they didn't go with a player a former player uh who came out of the queue um but tony maybe they wanted somebody to come in from outside the hockey community from outside the culture that has created this hazing type of thing somebody to come in and look at it who didn't come up in that environment and and have a have a fresher looks the right word but just somebody who's gonna like this is look at this and go this is crazy like why was this ever allowed to happen as opposed to somebody maybe coming in who did play in the league and maybe was hazed or took part in hazing. So I think it, it, I can understand why the league would want to go in this direction. I don't know if Mario has any hockey background. Maybe he does, and I'm mistaken. As I said, I don't, I don't know him well. I've never really dealt with him. But I think to bring somebody in from outside of the hockey world, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing. There's there's, there's one way of looking at it, that which uh, I, um, to tell you the truth, I wasn't looking at that point of view. Um, but it makes sense to me, Stu. It, it really makes sense to me. The reason why I had said a former NHLer, uh, Mark Denny's name has been in the mix, of course, Jocelyn mm-hmm. Thibault. A lot of respect for these two individuals yeah. who seem like they are not 
they are not dinosaurs of yesterday. It seems like they're 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 both men who have evolved tremendously with the times, and that's why I thought that even though being former players that they probably would have seen that culture before, they've evolved so much, and I thought that they would have made necessary changes. But well, uh, well I do know Mark a bit, and he's a I don't know Jocelyn Tebow, but I know Mark, and he's a really smart, bright, intelligent guy. Um, I don't know if he'd want that position. Maybe he's happy what he's doing uh, with RDS with the Canadians. Um, but again, I think it's a lot of hockey is an old boys club too, right? Guys take care of each other. You know, a GM gets fired. His buddy is a GM of another team, finds yeah. a job for him. And it's sort of hush, hush, wink, wink, maybe to some of this stuff, which is maybe why this hazing was allowed to go on for so long without coming to light. Um, but I said Mark Denis to me, I mean, if they'd hired Mark Denis as commissioner of the Quebec Junior Hockey, like I would have had no problem with that. Uh, but again, I just, I, it, I understand why they might have wanted to look outside the hockey world to bring somebody in. Uh, a shout out to Playground, who has over 600 machines, poker tournaments, and uh, Playground Casino games, daily promotions, unmatched customer service. Why go anywhere else? They're located just over the Mercier Bridge, only minutes from downtown Montreal. All right. Um, one of the things that's being talked about uh, right now is um, abolishing fighting in major in in junior hockey. Um, a lot of people have spoken out about it. I was pleasantly surprised. Uh, pleasantly surprised. I was a little bit surprised uh, that Patrick Waugh spoke out uh, to abolish fighting in hockey because Patrick is, you know, hockey is one of those uh, one of those things that's been in the game forever right and you'll find that you'll talk to a lot of hockey players and a lot of former hockey players who will tell you well it's always been part of the game right Patrick speaking of evolving clearly Patrick has evolved now as great a player as Patrick was uh he was involved in a couple of fights back in his heyday especially in the rivalries between the rivalry between the Colorado Avalanche and the Detroit Red Wings when I think he fought Osgood once he fought Vernon once and uh, his son was involved in a couple of really nasty fights in junior hockey. Patrick Waugh came out and said, enough is enough. This has to stop. It has to end. Stu, I've said this before. I'm going to say it again. As a teenager, I loved hockey fights. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not going to lie to anybody, right? I, I used to wear my Chris Nyland jersey, uh, have my uh, VHS remote in my hand, and the second that Chris Nyland would jump on the ice or John Cordick would, would get on the ice or Mario Roberts or Todd Ewan or Lyle Odeline or Shane Corson or anyone who really, uh, Mario Roberts who could drop the gloves with the Canadians, I would hit the record button. If they wouldn't get into a fight on that shift, I'd stop, I'd rewind, I'd go back to the beginning of the tape and their next shift, I would hit it again. And next thing you know, Within a year or two, I put together a, a six-hour VHS tape uh, of, of hockey fights, and uh, I used to watch them over and over and over again. That was then, Stu. Yep. And then Steve Montador, um, who fought a lot, um, his, his uh, lungs and his heart shut down. He died at 35. Derek Bulgard. Uh, who was uh, clearly depressed, uh, was taking painkillers and alcohol, and um, he passed away at 28 years of age. Rick Rippin, who was suffering from depression, he took his life at 27. Wade Belak also took his life at age 35. Bob Probert, who had a history of drug and alcohol addiction, his heart stopped when he was 45 years old. Uh, John Cordick hated the fight, but was very good at it. Uh, there's stories documented that he used to um, try to explain to his dad on the phone after games why he was fighting. His dad didn't like it. Cordick would break down and cry. And uh, at one point, he got heavy into steroids, heavy into drugs. And uh, he got into a fight, an altercation with police officers. And his heart stopped as well. All of that happened. We got more and more knowledgeable about CTE and the long-term effects of it. And it has to stop, Stu. And well, so I'm like you, 
Tony, I'm like you. I grew up, you know, rock and sock and hockey and loving Chris Nyland and loving the fights. I remember John Ferguson. I'm old enough to remember him. Uh, we all like the tough guys. But I've evolved to the point also, I mean, you look at, you know, the game last night, Jonathan Kovacevic throws a totally clean body check on a guy and has to fight. No instigator call even made on the play. No. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Yeah. And in junior hockey, when you have kids ranging in age from 16 to 20, uh, some are already men, some playing junior hockey. I remember Eric Lindros was 16 or 17 years old. He was already 210 pounds. And then you have all the other little guys. And I remember doing a story years ago on Vincent LeCavalier. And when he was deciding if he was going to go play junior or university hockey, and there's no fighting in university hockey, and university hockey seems to produce some pretty good NHL players like Cole Caulfield. Yeah. And his mom wanted him to go to university. His dad wanted him to play junior hockey. He ended up playing junior hockey. His parents drove to his first game in the Quebec Junior Hockey League. I can't remember if it was in Ramouski or maybe it was a road game somewhere. They get there. Son goes out for his first shift, 16 or 17 years old. Puck drops. Guy on the other team drops the gloves, grabs Vincent, and pummels him. First game in the Quebec Junior Hockey League. This is a future number one overall pick. And I remember asking his parents, how was the car ride home? And his father said, very quiet. His mother thinking, why did we put our son into this? And I think wow. – I think in junior hockey, a lot of parents, as I mentioned earlier, you're sending your 16, 17-year-old kid to go live away from home, live with billets, and to go into an arena. And it's not as bad as it used to be. I remember back, as I said, when I used to cover the Quebec Junior League uh, for the hockey teams. I remember when Matthew Barnaby was playing back then. Yeah, uh, There was a lot of good scrappers. College Francais team had uh, Donald Brashear. Yeah. Uh, Laval Titan at the time it was the House of Pain. George Larac. Uh, George, they had they had fighters there, and there was some real brawls. Uh, there was brawls in the stands too back then. But time we've evolved. We learn more about CT. We learn more about other things. And that you know that fight with Kovacev class, it was ridiculous. I mean, yeah. he, he, clean body check. Kovacev looks not a fighter, but he gets jumped for a clean body check. And I was watching the game on TSN, and um, oh, I can't remember who the color guy was last night. It was um, anyway, he's, and he said. You know, just get rid of uh, get rid of body checking. Man, if that's what's going to happen, every time you throw a body check, your guy has to fight somebody. Yeah, and, that, and that, body and checking that, out of the game. And that can't happen either because it is a contact sport. Like, exactly. Look, let's let's be honest. Well, here, well right? in, the NFL, like, in the NFL, guys, a linebacker, a running back, go up the middle, and a linebacker will knock him on his butt, and then pick him up afterwards. Yeah, a lot of the times, you know, it's it's there's no fight. It was a hard hit. It's part of the game. And um, no, it was it, it just makes uh, it makes sense. It was Craig Button actually. I think last name was a color guy. Yeah, that. yeah, yeah. So you know, someone says via via Twitter that right now Ryan Reeves is the last pure enforcer left in the National Hockey League. Not quite accurate. There's McDermott in Colorado. There's uh, Ni Nicola Deloria, obviously in Philadelphia. There's there's a few. There's obviously a lot less than there used to be when there used to be sometimes one per team before that there used to be two per team. And sometimes yeah. there used to be the entire fourth line would yeah. be guys that could take care Broad. of themselves. Right. Broad but, street bullies, the broad street bullies. Of course. I mean, of course. Look at Arbor Jack guy, the great rookie season he was having. Yeah. And now it's over because of being thankfully he didn't get punched in the nose or punched in the head and knocked out, but he threw his yeah. shoulder out in a fight. And it's, you know, I grew up loving fighting. If they took fighting out of the NHL, I'd be, I'd, I'd be happy. I would, like, yeah. To me, it's, to me, it's, you know, the, the, the odd, I mean, tempers get, get hot and stuff happens and two guys might sort of still fight, but you know, it's a penalty or, or game suspension the next game or something if they want to do it that way. But to no, see but the, the stage fights do nothing for me. And even more than that now is it's anybody who throws a clean body check. Now you got to fight a guy afterwards. So as Craig Button said, if that's the rules and no instigator penalty either last night, but but Stu, didn't want to fight. Stu, I, I hate the argument that it's always been that way, right? You 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 get into a discussions uh with people about any subject, right? And they'll tell you, well, yeah, well, it's always been that way. Well, that doesn't make it right, right? Well, because not you know, like uh, uh, you know, people. like like you know, the 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 kind of punishments we used to probably get or the way we were treated by you know, our parents, when we were kids, like, it's just, it's not like that anymore in 2023. Like there's, you know, there's, there's, there's process, there's steps that you go through and there's an evolution, right? It's always been that way. So now let, let's talk about this for a second. Well, right? The other thing that's ridiculous about NHL fighting too, or junior fighting, you're fighting a guy who's got a helmet. He's got a visor down at the here. 
know, 80% of your punches are either landing on a helmet or landing on a visor. Um, you know, Cobra, Ch- you, you look at uh, the, the fight, Arbor Jack guy's hands are all oh, the skin's gone on his knuckles and that, you know, yeah. more than half the punches you throw are hitting a helmet or hitting yeah. a visor. And yeah, you're, more some, like, you're more likely to break your hand in a fight yeah. than basically anything else. You're right, Sue. Sometimes the guy who actually you think wins the fight is the guy who lost it because his hands are more beat up than the other guy's face. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It, it, it's it's to me, it's uh you know, it was a thing as you mentioned, Tony. We grew up the hockey fights, the video fights, but yeah, you know, I could I could do without fighting hockey right now. Look. There's a lot of people watching right now on YouTube Live, and if you're liking this podcast, if you can message sick, S-I-C-K. Actually, if you think uh, fighting in hockey is sick in a bad way uh, because it's not good and you want to get rid of it, message S-I-C-K right now. If you like our podcast, hit the like button, share it with your friends, tell them about it. Of course, we're on YouTube Live, Facebook Live, and Twitter Live. Subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already. Stu, a lot of people watching right now, a lot of people are like you and I used to be back in the 80s, the 90s, where we loved hockey fights. And they still do. Here's the reality for those people, all right? You want to hear the real things? The most popular sport in North America, especially, especially in the United States, is football and the NFL. Mm -hmm. That's the number one sport in North America, okay? Basketball is an extremely popular sport in the United States. Baseball is an extremely popular sport in the United States. Uh, the two of them that are really probably more important right now or, or, you know, bigger right now than the rest are football and basketball, I would say, has really been coming on with the young generation, all right? I mean, in football, football is a contact sport. Do they rip off their helmets? And start throwing punches at each other. No, so no. They, they're more likely to pick the guy up after you knock him on his butt with a hard hit. But it's it's the number one sport, right? So what? Are, why, why does hockey? Why does hockey need fighting? Can somebody think, explain, because, and, and, and Stu, this whole a hockey fight can change the momentum of a game. It's funny, okay? And I'm going to tell you why, and I'll give you an opportunity to respond to this. When a team is trailing. And there's a hockey fight that goes their way, that a player wins the fight, the team comes back and wins. Everyone will say it changed the momentum of the game. When the team doesn't come back, nobody says nothing. Come on, it's really so stupid. I mean, one of the I think the main reason the NHL keeps it in is because they think it's they, it's a way to market it to people who aren't necessarily hockey fans. You know, in places in the states, uh, you go to a hockey game. Uh, you know, sort of what was it, the old joke? I went to the fights and a hockey game broke out. Um, I think that's the only thing that sort of makes sense for the nhl keeping it in there is that they think they need that to sell the game and i really don't think they do i mean if you want to watch two guys beat the crap out of each other yeah. watch ufc you know, can- and it, Stu, it really it, you know i have a lot of respect for everyone who's involved in the game especially who you know and i like it, who do what we do uh, media, whether it's print journalism, it's sports talk radio, it's 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 sports television, it's play by play, it's color. But I have to tell you, Jack Edwards really gets on my nerves. He really gets on my nerves like big time because um, he, like the way he describes a fight, it's like he's more excited about a fight than he is about you know, a three-way passing play between Bergeron, Marchand, and Pasternak, who ends up firing it into the top corner. Like, every time a Boston Bruin is involved in a fight and the other player lands four or five shots on a Bruins player, there's dead silence on television. You're not going to hear nothing. The second the Bruin lands one punch, he makes it sound like it's the biggest, hardest punch ever known to me. He goes crazy, and the fans get into it. It's it's so like 1970s. It's it's disgusting, man. I it's it's I I hate it. I well, really hate it. He's one of the ultimate homers, and he's obviously old school, and he still likes fighting. And I'm sure there's some old school people out there who like him. They still like it that that they haven't evolved, I guess, or realized the. No, I'm still amazed that nobody's died in a fight yet in the NHL. Um, it's it's less likely now that they can't take off their helmets when they fight, but I still a helmet falls off, and you think it's it's bare knuckle fighting too, and it's it's maybe that's the only thing that would ever make the NHL get rid of. I don't even know if that would, um, 
I don't think the NHL has any interest in taking fighting out of the game. Um, I think they think it's part of something they need to sell the game. And uh, as you yeah. say, the most popular sport in North America is football. And they beat the crap out of each other. And yeah. You know, I think they, there's a... Traveling or, and, uh, you know, university hockey. We're talking about university hockey and junior hockey. Okay, so you have a son, Tony. I have a son. The really yeah. good hockey players are 17 years old. You're deciding where they're going to go. Are they going to go play junior hockey? Or are they going to go play university hockey? And like the discussion what Calvary's parents had, you got to be leaning towards junior hockey. Or sorry, towards university hockey. Because yeah. uh, partly it's, it's a better environment. Uh, there's education involved. It's hard to study and go to school when you're playing 80 games a year and riding buses in junior. But yeah. you're also not worried that your 17-year-old son's going to get the crap beaten out of him by some yeah. tough guy on the other team. No, it's not going to happen. So that's, yeah. that's, no. that factors into it, and that would factor into my decision if my son was going to go play hockey, whether he was going to play junior or whether he was going to uh, uh, go to university. Well, it's funny because, uh, what was it, about a month ago, you did a story on Michael Matheson, uh, whose, uh, whose parents, uh, of course, are, are here in Montreal. He grew yeah. up on the West Island in Point Clair. Uh, he went to John Rennie, was in the Spotted Tood program. I talked about the fact that I had a chance to interview him probably when he was about uh, 15 years old or whatever it was. But when he was 17 years old or 16 years old, he actually left to play in the USHL with Dubuc. Mm-hmm. And then after that, he went to Boston College for three years, right? As a 17 yeah. and uh, 18 and 19 year old, he went to Boston College. Uh, Stu, he played 36 games one season. 38 games another season, 38 games another season. Uh, he was able to, to obviously get his education. A very, very smart young man. He was able to, uh, very educated. Uh, well, well, you know, 38 games, not a lot. You're able to get Tony, in your homework. and yeah. Tony, I, I, I had this discussion with his dad a couple yeah. of years ago. Before he was with the Canadians, he was still with, uh, he was still with Florida at the time. And a good buddy of mine is, uh, is good friends with Matheson's dad. And I've got to know Matheson's dad that way. And I was asking him, you know, how tough it was a decision to go to junior or go to university. And Mike would have been a top number one or number two pick in the Quebec Junior League. Yeah. He's being heavily recruited by the colleges. So his dad, they left it up to him to make the decision. But they wanted him to weigh all his options. So they visited some schools. They visited some Quebec Junior teams. And I can't remember, it was one of the teams, I think, in the East that had the number one or number two picked at you, and they went to visit him, and Mike was really impressed with the facilities and impressed with the coach and impressed with everything else. And they got home, and his dad pulled out that team's schedule for the next season with all the games. And he said, okay, look at that and tell me when you're going to go to the gym. Yeah. Look at that schedule, tell me when you're going to study. Look at that schedule and tell me when you're going to do all the other stuff that, you know, And then Mike went, he said, like, the light bulb went off. And he went, yeah, I'm going to have no time to go to the gym and train. Yeah. I'm going to have no time to study. Um, And that's so, yeah, he played 38 games or whatever, but he was in the gym every day. Yeah. He was eating well. He was sleeping well. He wasn't getting in a bus at, uh, you know, 11 o'clock at night and riding, you know, with a St. Hubert barbecue chicken or something in front of you and and riding to the next thing. So the university, (coughs) excuse me, the college route, they play their games usually on the weekend, Friday, Sunday. You practice every day during the week. <laughs> Excuse me. You practice every day during the week. You go to the gym every day. And I think, you know, going back to Louis LeBlanc. Yeah. I remember when Louis LeBlanc went to Harvard. Yeah. And that summer they had that sports celebrity breakfast that you and I go to. Uh, yeah. 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 And yeah. Louis was there. And I saw him and I couldn't believe how skinny he was. Like he had no muscles on him whatsoever. Great hockey player at the time. Yeah. And then when he left Harvard. Yeah. And he went to play junior. Here's a kid who could, should, who could have and should have been in the gym five, six days a week Great instead point. of playing 80 games and riding buses. So, you know, playing 80 games isn't the be all and end all. I mean, if you're a Sidney Crosby or uh, whatever, and you're going to be the number one overall pick, maybe that'll help you, Connor Bedard. But if you're not, if you're a kid, you know, it's Alex Kalorn, another West Island boy who went to, went to Harvard. I remember his mom telling me when he went to Harvard his first year, he was. Six one and like 165 pounds or something. And he came back after his second year at Harvard and they had a dug in pool in the backyard and he came back home and he went in his room. He got changed. He came out with just a bathing suit on and his mother looked at him and went, Oh my God, is that my son? 
he had filled out. He had, was ripped. He had been, you know, been in the gym four or five days a week, played 38 hockey games, but was in the gym probably 150 times or more. Uh, so that's that, you know, you got to factor that all that stuff in. It's not all about just playing games, especially at that age. Yeah. You're young and your body's maturing. It's developing mentally, developing physically, sleeping well, eating well, training well. You know, all these university teams, they have strength coaches. A lot of them work out with the football players. They have the same yeah. gym, they have whatever. It's it's an environment to develop mentally, to develop physically. Yeah. And um, as I said, you know, if my son that played was a hockey player was going to go, had a choice of doing either one of those routes, I would no doubt that I'd be sending him to university. Route. Yeah, I, I personally, I think it's with all due respect to the Q, I think it's a no brainer. Uh, but, uh, I mean, to each his own, right? Because there are, mm -hmm. there are instances where the cue could be better for a player, but I think for the masses, I, I think going, uh, the U S college route that we talked about is better, but, uh, just our opinion, of course, before well, we Connor get, Bernard, Connor Bernard will probably develop better playing 80 games or whatever. Yes. Like yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. His skill level and everything else, but a kid like an Alex Killorn or, or yeah. the Mike Matheson, Mike Matheson would have been, you know, the number one or number two pick in the Quebec junior league, but his father was able to convince him that he was going to develop better as a hockey player and as a person by going on the university route. And, yeah. You know, and I think they got it right, right? They got it well, right. Without, it's worked without out. Without a doubt. Without yeah. a doubt. And he's got a degree. He also met his wife when he was at Boston College. And he was playing for the women's hockey team. Um, and, you know, look at Jordan Harris. Jordan Harris, one of the nicest, smartest kids I've ever talked to. Yeah. Uh, he went back for his fourth year because he wanted – to be able to experience his fourth year at university. He got ripped off a little bit in COVID, not getting the full experience, and he wanted to go back and have be a u university student. It's a pretty fun life. Yeah. He knew he was going to play in the NHL. He knew the money was going to come. Uh, he wasn't in a rush, and look at him. He steps into the NHL. He, he's ready to play right away, right? He's already been playing against men for the last couple of years, um, and, and so to me, it, to me, it's a no-brainer. I mean, not every – you also got to – you know, be academically strong enough to get into the university of hockey. But if you have the option to go Quebec junior league or to play uh, the college route to me, it's, it's, it's a no brainer. Yeah. There's another thing we have to think of too, when you play 80 games compared to playing 38, right? The more games you play, the more chance of getting injured you have as well. And if you yeah. get to the national hockey league and you've already sustained like five concussions, you're not going to have a very long career. I, I spoke to Guillaume well, Latondres about this probably, about a month and a half ago or two months ago, and his career was cut prematurely because of concussions. And I said to him, I said, Guillaume, how many do you have in the National Hockey League? And he looked at me and he said, Tony, I had the majority of my concussions in junior hockey before I got to the National Hockey League. And he told me stories of, like, he would play in the queue already concussed. Like, he would, you know, and, and the coaches would, you're playing, you're playing, you're playing, eh? And, and you know what? You... You know, the coaches want you to play because their job is on the line sometimes. And, oh. you know, if you can help them win a hockey game, I mean, they're worried about that more than your concussion. Well, Alex Killorn's mom had a great line when I interviewed her. And she said, I always sold my son to the highest bidder. What are you going to give him? Now, don't let that line use hockey. Don't let hockey use you. Yeah. Perfect example of that. What, what, what's my son going to do for you? Now, what's, oh, he's going to get a Harvard education? Okay, that sounds pretty good. He's going to play uh, 38 games a year. He's going to be able to eat well and sleep well and do everything else like that. Yeah. Sounds like a pretty good plan to me. You know, use hockey. Don't let hockey use you. And that's, you know, that interesting conversation with Jake Allen. I have part of me, Stu. Stu, I had that conversation with my father-in-law. You want me to marry your daughter? <laughs> what am I going to get out of this? All right. How much are you going to bring to the table here? You, you're throwing some money down or what? What are we talking about here? 100,000, a couple of super sads, a couple of provolones. What are we talking about here? <laughs> I had an interesting conversation with Jake Allen in one of the, it was either in Booktush or Gander, one of those craft hockey ball games this year. Just talking about, you know, the injuries. There's already guys like Matheson was injured, right? In training camp, a lot of these guys were hurt. Yeah. And um, I was asking him, you know, what do you think, like, all these injuries? And he literally says, well, I says, personally, he says, I think it's because these kids start playing hockey 12 months a year when they're seven, eight years old now. They don't play any other sports. By the time they're 18, 19, 20 in the NHL, skating isn't a natural motion, right? It's not natural for your hips to use that motion in skating or yeah. your groins and all that other stuff. And he, he insists that a lot of the reason you're seeing so many of these young guys hurt all the time in the NHL is because they've just played too much hockey. They played 12 months a year from the time they're eight, nine, 10 years old. 
they never use, you know, they don't play soccer or baseball or tennis or other sports in the summer to use other muscle groups. Uh, it's the same muscle groups that are being used all the time. And skating, as I said, it's not a natural motion. And he, he said he thinks that's the reason why you're seeing so many younger players having hip issues and groin issues and all these issues because they played too much hockey since they were a young age. Uh, we're going to talk about the Montreal Canadiens in just 30 seconds time. Okay. But I'll just end it with this before you talked about, you know, the reason why, you know, hockey's fighting still in the national hockey league. And you said that uh, they probably feel like some markets, they have to sell it that way. And I'm going to just add one more thing. In my opinion, they're worried about taking hockey out of the game, uh, fighting out of the game, not only for that, because they think that some people still like it and that, some people might not might lose well, there's interest. Well, definitely people who still like it. There's, there's no definitely people who still like. And another reason why I don't think they'll take it out of the game, Stu, is that if they take it out of the game, I think they're really worried that someone's going to sue their pants off for all the damages that fighting actually did to a lot of players when they did play. And the National Hockey League is scared of another lawsuit regarding fighting, um, the the you know the the concussions. And, and all the dangers thereof. Okay, let's let's. Well, Gary Batman first and foremost is a lawyer, right? Yeah, and that's why they, they he, he won't even admit that CTE is a. a of factor. course not. Of course not. Because of that, that. He's, he's a he's a lawyer. He, he's yeah. He's, it's, no. it's, his it's, job is to, his job is to make as much money as possible for the owners and protect yeah. the owners. And that's what he's doing. It's 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 pretty disturbing though that that discussion. But you know you're right. But it's pretty disturbing. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Canadians, th three or four issues here. Uh, I find it mind-boggling, and I'm hearing this more and more, and not from, you know, but from f that Raphael RV Pinard is not guaranteed a spot next year. And I understand no one's guaranteed a spot. I mean, you end up solidifying a spot at camp, but what does this kid have to do to show that he belongs on the Montreal Canadiens? I'd be shocked if he's not with the Canadians start next season. I, I'd be shocked. Marty, Marty St. Louis must see a little bit of himself. And and I asked Marty St. Louis this question after earlier, maybe a month or so ago, when you You're cutting out, Stu. Did I lose you for a second here or what? What's the story here? I lost you, Stu. Oh, Stu is frozen. Okay, let's uh, let's you know try and bring Stu back at some point here right. when we can fix this. Okay, uh, okay. Stu's back. Uh, Matrix Home Fitness. Just a quick shout out to them. Discover a club quality workout in the comfort of your own home. Bring it home. Whether it's the treadmill, whether it's the elliptical, whether it's the rower, whether it's an exercise bike, it's MatrixHomeFitness.ca. And I would imagine a lot of Montreal Canadiens players and National Hockey League players, especially Canadian teams, have a good Matrix. Uh, uh, home fitness equipment already at their house. Okay, you're back. You were saying, yeah, so I was talking about Harvey Pinar and I asked Marty St. Louis, you know, does he remind you of you a little bit? You know, Marty was never drafted, smaller guy, had to prove himself, was put on waivers, not claimed. And he said, He says, Look, nobody gives you opportunities, you got to make your opportunities, yeah, <laughs> never make the most of your opportunities. That's exactly what Harvey Pinard's done. And you know, when he was in Laval, his nickname was Lavalliger, and he plays like Brendan Gallagher, he's like a young, healthy Brendan Gallagher. He goes to the dirty areas. He four checks. He works his butt off every time he's on the ice, and he can play with good players. I mean, him and Nick Suzuki. They, he can play with Nick Suzuki. They complement each other. He's on the power play. He wins puck battles. Uh, he's hard on the four check. He's done. I'd be really surprised if he's not with the Canadians to start next season. I'd really, really be surprised. The way he's playing right now, uh, you know, he's on pace over a full season. It'll be a forty-two goal season. Um, we you know when Cole Caulfield got injured. Marty St. Louis said, we need not something not only to replace his goals, but to replace his enthusiasm. Yeah. Harvey Pernard's done both of those things. The kid is living his dream playing for the Montreal Canadiens. Yeah. And he play he plays like it every single time he's on the ice. He looks like a kid who's living his dream, and he's going to do everything he possibly can to keep that dream going. And I'd be really surprised if he's not part of this team to start next season. Eight goals in 19 games, that would be 16 and 38. Uh, that would be 32 and 76. I mean, his numbers yeah, are. Really, out, it didn't matter. The worst had to get 42 goal pace. It's, you know, which obviously he's not going to get. But no. who knows? You never say that. But it, just a great season for him. It's awesome. Now, Alex Belzil, I doubt will be on the Montreal Canadiens next year. Like, I don't think so. No. I think he'll be back uh, with the Laval Rocket in the American Hockey League. But I will say this. 
What a great story. And eh? like he's oh. he's he's an honest player. He's an honest player and he's a great guy to talk to. You talk about being honest. You know, I was asking him about you know, not being drafted and being so late to get into the NHL. And he says, Well, I'm not stupid. I knew skating. Like I wasn't a good enough skater. And I just mm-hmm. kept working on it and working on it and working on it. Like still now, he's still working on it. He knows what his weaknesses were, but he's so when I watch him, Tony, he's so smart with the puck. You know, he's really smart with the puck. He makes smart dump ins. They're not even like dump ins. It's almost like a pass dump in. He's just he, he's smart in his own end. He just he thinks the game so well, probably because he's had to compensate from not being a great skater coming up. He had to do other things better, had to think the game better, be smarter, work a little harder. Um, and he's done all of that. And it, what a really, really, really nice story he's been this year. To see a guy come yeah. up at that age, score his first NHL goal. You look how happy all his teammates were for him. And Marty St. Louis said also, you know, he's captain of Laval, but he came to the Canadians and he was immediately became like a leader in the room. He's an older guy. Mm-hmm. You know, you're looking at, uh, you know, you're looking at a guy like or Cole Caulfield, one of the young guys in Nick Suzuki, a first round pick who the road to the NHL has been a little bit easier, a lot easier. Um, and here's a guy who's just had to bust his butt all along, never gave up on his dream of playing in the NHL. And then he ends up playing for the Canadians also. And I think he, I think he gave a, him and Pernard both give a spark in the locker room. Nick Suzuki mentioned that to me. They both give a boost in that locker room when these other guys are looking at them. You know, sometimes your first round pick, your veteran player, the team's not doing well. You sort of maybe forget how lucky you are to play in the mm-hmm. NHL, how fortunate you are, what a great opportunity it was. And how, you know, you should enjoy every day. It's a, the career ends quick, right? Guys, when yeah. it's over, they tell you how quick it went. I, I, it amazes me when you watch guys in the NHL who don't bust their butt every time they're on the ice because it is such a short career. Yeah, And it's refreshing when you see guys like Harvey Pinard and yeah. Brazil come up and, and just embrace everything about playing in the NHL and realizing that it could be taken away from them at any moment. The only reason they're here is because there were so many injuries. And as Marty St. Louis said, you know, you get an opportunity, you got to make the most of it. Nobody's going to hand you anything. And both of these guys... I've really done that. And Belzil, yeah, I don't think he doesn't really have a future with the Canadians. No. Uh, maybe back in Oh, you wonder if maybe another team's seen enough out of him to maybe sign him to a one-year contract. You would hope because he's such a good guy, like you said, and uh, it would be a real nice story. Uh, Jesse Yelonen, Harvey Pinard scores yesterday. The assist comes off of Jesse Yelonen. Stu, here's an interesting discussion about this player because he's 23 years old. There's still margin, of course, for progression. Some players come into their own at 25 or 26. He's only played 37 National Hockey League games over three seasons, 36 of which have been over the last two seasons. I wonder, Stu, if this player still has, when we take a look at his ceiling, two other levels. Because if he does, you would think he's going to have to hit them. If he wants to be a player on this team out of the gate next year, and be a National Hockey League player with regularity, he's going to need to hit two other levels, don't you think? I agree. And the thing with all these injuries I've done, it's it's been a blessing in a way for the Canadians because it's allowed Kent Hughes and Jeff Gordon to see players, and Marty St. Louis to see players at the NHL level that they wouldn't have seen before. Right? They would have just seen Harvey Pernard and Laval and seen Belzil and seen the Olinin and seen these guys playing Laval. It's one thing to look good and play well in Laval. It's another thing to do with the NHL when it's a little bit quicker. You don't have as much time to think. Guys are on you more. Uh, so, yeah, so they're going to – but, you know, there's another, what, 19 games left. Yolan is going to be here the whole time, and it's it's a tryout for next season. But you're right. I think he needs to bring more than what he – or show more than he's shown so far. Uh, they say no spots are guaranteed, but to sort of give himself a, a really good chance of making the team next year. Whereas Harvey Pinard, I think, has done that already, and I think Harvey Pinard will continue. I don't think, I don't think Harvey Pinard is gonna. He, he is. He's Lavalager. I mean, Brendan Gallagher doesn't know how to not play a hundred percent. Yeah. And Harvey Pinard, you know, Brendan's paid the price. His body's broken down on him, unfortunately, over the years. And now you bring up uh, Harvey Pinard, who's like a young Brendan Gallagher, plays with the same, you know, piss and vinegar every time he's out there. Uh, and, and works his butt off, and and you know it's it's as I said earlier, it's nice to see, and I think Yolan needs to add a little bit of that. No, I'm not like he's got he's more skilled than Harvey Pinard. He just needs to maybe be a little bit more uh, uh, gritty and be willing to pay pay the price that Harvey Pinard is willing to pay to score goals. Hey Stu, I got great news for those who are looking at uh, the Canadians' chances of uh, dropping in the standings. And, uh, you know, thus giving them a better shot in the lottery and the Connor Bedard sweepstakes. And the good news, Stu, is this, okay? 
is that the um, take a look at the wild card, okay, in the um, in the uh, in the Eastern Conference. All right, uh, the Islanders have the first wild card with seventy two points. Pittsburgh have the second wild card with seventy one points. The Ottawa Senators, by the way, this is devastating. What's happened to them tonight? They they were twelve three and one in their last sixteen games before tonight's game. But believe it or not, they're actually losing by a score of four to nothing in Chicago after two periods of play. But let's look at Ottawa, right? They're three points behind Pittsburgh and four points behind the Islanders with like two or three games in hand, okay, uh, on, on the Islanders. Uh, they're going to have to win their games between now and the end of the year. Buffalo's tied with 68 points. They lost to the Oilers tonight. They're going to have to win their games between now and the end of the year. Florida. It also has 68 points. They're going to have to win their games between now and the end of the year. Washington has 68. They're going to have to win their games between now and the end of the year. Detroit has 65. They're going to have to win their games. So the teams like that are in the uh, in the the Eastern Conference and, and ahead of the Canadians who are in second last, uh, every game is a big game to make the playoffs, right? And yeah. Yeah. and so there um, there's incentive for them to win. And so I look at the Canadian schedule, which, by the way, is the toughest schedule of any team between now and the end of the year. I think it's safe to say that, Stu, things are setting up for the Canadians to lose like a high percentage of games. Well, the, the, last, of the, way. the last three games in this road trip, Tony, for people who are you know, like the tank or, or want them yeah. to finish, have been fantastic because they've lost them all by one goal only. They've competed yeah. hard. They've battled. They haven't given up. They've worked their butts off. They've tried as hard as they can to win. And they've just come up a little bit short. And I think that's what we're going to see going the rest of the way. This is, you know, as I mentioned earlier, they're getting a chance to look at players that they probably wouldn't have had a chance to look at. They've beaten teams that have no, had no business beating. They had no business beating the Oilers at home. They had no business, uh, you know, they beat Toronto there that one game. There, But the, the compete level is there. And, you know, Marty St. Louis said this whole season was about, developing the young guys and creating the culture and the environment or the brand, the Marty Ellis is the brand of hockey that they want to play. And we're seeing that brand and we're seeing that brand with guys who aren't as talented as the guys will be two years from now or three years from now, as this rebuild goes on. But I'm not a fan of tanking. I think it just creates a losing environment in the room. Players won't tank. Professional athletes don't tank. They want to win. They want their next contract. They have bonus clauses, uh, whatever it might be. Management can make it more difficult for them to win by trading of course. players. And now just, you know, the injuries, you know, the 11 guys were out of the lineup. Yeah. And a lot of key guys, that makes it a lot harder to win. So, yeah, Kane's going to lose a lot more games going forward. But you hope, and I don't think it'll happen. You don't want it to be like at the end of Dominic Ducharme's reign as coach, <clears throat> where the players, you can tell, they didn't care anymore. Stu, I, I, think it's, I think it's safe to say Columbus is 46 points and Chicago's got 47 yeah. Uh, right now, before this result here, we'll see what happens. Uh, Columbus got 46, Chicago's got 47, the Canadians have 56. I think it's safe to say that no matter how bad the Canadians are and no matter how good Columbus or Chicago could be between now and the end of the year, which doesn't look like they're going to be good, no. that they're not going to leapfrog the Canadians, okay? So they're not going to no, finish I mean, Chicago's last. in full tank mode. I mean, they traded yeah. away all their guys, and they're in yeah. full tank mode. So they're, they're not going to finish last, and they're not going to finish second last. However, however, San Jose, Anaheim, Arizona, Vancouver are behind the Canadians. Anywhere from six to one point behind the Canadians. And the Canadians do have a couple, a game in hand on San Jose, and they're pretty much tied with the other teams. Uh, the Canadians could lose ground on these teams. Like the Canadians could yeah. end up behind these teams in the standing based on, once again, listen to this schedule, Stu. Their next four games at home. Versus Carolina, versus the Rangers, versus the Devils, and versus the Avalanche. Now, I know anything can happen in hockey, and anything can beat any team. Yeah. Realistically, they, they should lose all four. Yeah, re realistically, they should lose all four, and they'll probably win one. Just the way, you know, you mentioned that. Right? correct. You know, yeah, they'll probably win one of the four. Um, no, they'd be shocked if they went two and two, but just the way things go, you mentioned, uh, you know, Ottawa's losing tonight to Chicago. Yeah, and Chicago's Chicago's in full tank mode. Um, yeah, so yeah, as it at the end of the day, the Canes are going to be in the lottery to have a chance at getting Connor Bedard, right? Yeah, it looks like 
you know, what's going on now with Florida, Florida might not make the playoffs. That gives you, that's going to give them two high picks in this year's draft. Yeah. And so many people seem to forget that it's all focused on Connor Bedard. How many talented players the Canadians already have from past first round? You know, you got Cole Caulfield, you got Nick Suzuki, you got Kirby Doc, you got, uh, you know, you go down the list of guys that they have, you know, you know Caden Gooley, you got Jordan Harris, you got uh, all these young guys coming up. Uh, um, it's, there's a lot of young, they have a lot of young talent on this team. Like, it's not like they're in full, full tank mode. They got nothing and you're hoping you have Connor Bernard and nothing else. Like they got a, if they don't, if they get Connor Bernard, well, let, me, let me, let me, let me ask but you But if this. they don't get Connor Bernard, they're going to get two more. Perfect. First round picks. Philip Massar at rookie camp this year was impressive as hell. He was much more impressive. than I South agree with Austin. you. He's a player. He's going to be able to play. They got a lot of young guys coming up that are good. So, yeah, it's, and we haven't. Even, I'd, I'd rather be in the Canadian situation. Yeah, and we haven't even. That has nothing is going to have Connor Bedard, and then okay, well, who's he going to play with? Yeah, and we haven't even talked about Slavkovsky, right? But um, but let me ask you this though: out of the players that they, all these young players that they have, right? I think it's safe to say they don't have a generational talent. But so let me ask you this though: out of all those players, do you think any one of them is a franchise player? Well, the franchise player, I mean. Look at Edmonton. Connor McDavid's the best player in the NHL. They got Leon Dreisaitl also. They haven't, you know, they won I think three playoff series since they got McDavid. I'd rather have five or six, <coughs> excuse me, really talented first first round pick talent guys than have one number one guy. Oh, so look, I understand your point. Um, my point is just that if they uh, if they um, if uh, they continue to lose more games and should they, you know, by, by all the luck in the world, end up having the number one pick, they're still going to have all those players that they still have. Plus they'll be able to add a franchise player. I mean, that's well, yeah, all, and, and they're going to have a chance. I mean, people it's okay. So you tank, you know, I think it's what 18.5% chance you have if you finish last. Yeah. And you know, you have 7% chance if you finish 27th i'm just thinking off the top of my head so yeah you still, yeah you still got a chance you know you still so got so you know it's funny because we t- we talked about the games at home here versus carolina versus the rangers versus the devils versus colorado we said realistically they should lose all four but you said because the national hockey league is what it is and any team could beat any team that they'll probably win one and then after that there's the, let's take a look at there's there's a second half of that schedule where they're at pittsburgh they're at florida they're at tampa they come home to play tampa and then they go to boston those five games, realistically, they should probably lose all of them too. But because the National Hockey League is what it is, they're probably going to end up winning one. So, you know, they're probably going to end up winning two of their next nine games here. Watch yeah. them end up winning all night. But anyway, well, you know what, Tony? I, I wrote a column recently. I'm trying to remember the numbers off the top of my head, but I think I'm correct here. It's 28 years that they've had the draft lottery now. Yeah. And the worst team has won the draft lottery 11 times. Okay, it works out okay. like 39%. And it's happened the last two years in a row. Okay. The odds of it happening three years in a row are not good if you just go by statistics and numbers. So, like, if you were playing the odds and playing the statistics, you would say that the team that finishes last this year is not going to get the number one pick because it's happened the last two years in a row, just playing percentages. Stu, unless you call my mother because she has a saying and says it all the time, Noche due senza tre. There's no two without three, my mother says. But <laughs> chances are you're right, Stu. I think that was a pretty funny joke. So on this note, I think why don't we end it, right? It's the Canadians versus the five-point man. You spare yeah. Kakanyemi who picked Very up five Kakenyemi. points yesterday. Huh? Five goal points. And four assists. Hey, isn't that, so- isn't that something? On Saturday night, John Cooper uh, benches his three best players. And how do they respond? They lose seven nothing to the Carolina Hurricanes the game after that. So they clearly yeah. said to the coach, "You wanted to embarrass us. We're going to embarrass you." Wow. Okay. So on that note, Stu, thank you so much. Over an hour of your time. You know this, Stu. I've told you I'm extremely grateful. Thanks so much. I appreciate it. My Stu. pleasure, Tony. Anytime. All day. right. There you have it. Stu Counter, the Montreal Gazette, and HockeyInsideOut.com. Tell your friends about it. Comment right now. 
If you love this podcast, sick, S-I-C-K, on YouTube Live, on Facebook Live, on Twitter Live, share it with your friends. And if you listen on Google, Apple, or Spotify, leave us a five-star review. That's our way of feeling the love. It's the Canadians versus the Carolina Hurricanes. Tomorrow night, I'll be back. Same time, same place. The Sick Podcast, Monday to Friday at 10 p.m. The hoodie says it all. I'm Marinaro. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the Sick Podcast with Tony Marinaro on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts. The Sick Podcast is brought to you by Energy Transportation Group. Driven to be different. La Vida TV. Embrace your true nature. And La Cage. If the last time you went to La Cage was when the Habs won the cup, it's time you went back to La Cage. The menu will surprise you.